Transpersonal Healing, Part 2, Influences. We're going to look at traditional Asian medicine and indigenous medicine and their influences in transpersonal psychology, transpersonal healing, and contemporary Western healing practices. Now that we have briefly discussed contemporary Western transpersonal healing perspectives, we can now consider Eastern traditions and how they have been an influence. Despite the new evolutionary view of transpersonal healing in Western medicine, we are just now in the early part of the 21st century beginning to broadly incorporate a holistic preventative model of health over the previous one that focused primarily on curing difficult physical and emotional symptoms after they appear. Now there are integrative therapies that assist us in repatterning our dysfunctional behavior and responses. For example, the physical ones we've already discussed. But there is also a great emphasis on changing poor dietary habits and or engaging in anti-stress exercises because we now acknowledge through evidence-based research that certain foods or behaviors not only affect our physical selves but our minds, our psycho-emotional selves as well. If we consider traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda and yogic medicines, Tibetan medicine, and indigenous native medicines that are both shamanic and herbal in practice, we see that they usually include a comprehensive body-mind, social, and environmental model of prevention and treatment. They traditionally have been more concerned with the unity of one's entire personal and transpersonal environment. In other words, again, the eight dimensions of health. Some aspects of these traditions are now being reflected in our Western transpersonal health models in various ways. Some examples of this are found in the following. Contemplative psychotherapeutic environments, meditation, prayer, and contemplation practices as they relate to healing the mind and body, various consciousness-altering methods for personal insight, these are often found in therapeutic environments, but not always. For example, the use of drumming from indigenous shamanic practice, and the use of hypnotherapy and biofeedback to both experience altered states of consciousness and to become much more deeply aware and perhaps exert some control on some body responses, for example, the autonomic nervous system. Therapy that involves nature and natural environments, and retreats are often used for therapeutic reasons. Dance, music, or art therapy as part of the healing process. And energy medicine, the healing application of ancient practices that we find often in our culture now, such as yoga, tai chi, qigong, and some practices like shiatsu acupuncture. Newer approaches influenced by these, such as emotional freedom technique, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, Reiki, newer hybrid forms of yoga, and many other hands-on healing methods. For a more in-depth look at one of the Asian holistic systems, we will briefly consider the meridians of the body in the theory of traditional Chinese medicine. The meridians are accessed through acupuncture needles or with hands-on healing methods such as shiatsu and acupressure. The twelve main meridians carry qi, the energetic life force of the body. In TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, and in Chinese Taoism, nature is understood as a constant flow of energy expressed in relative quality as either yin, quieter or less vigorous, and yang, stronger or larger in essence. This applies to manifested reality like our physical bodies as it does to more ephemeral natural elements like wind. For example, a mild breeze versus a hurricane wind. Each meridian is either yin or yang in nature relative to its partnered pair. It has a corresponding color, a physical location in the body, a relationship to an internal organ, an association with the spirit or soul of the person, a specific season of the year when it has heightened sensitivity, 
particular balanced and imbalanced emotions, certain foods and herbs that affect it positively or detrimentally, and specific environmental factors which may affect it detrimentally more than others. The entire meridian system is circulatory in nature, and each meridian has an interconnecting relationship with the others. In the etiology of TCM, there are six exogenous factors, meaning outside of the body from nature, that affect the energies of the meridians and can therefore create a variety of psychophysical conditions within the body-mind complex. These six factors are listed as wind, heat, fire, being a more intense heat, dampness, dryness, and cold. As you can see, this traditional medicine understands the human experience as being in and of nature, not separate from it. Let's take a quick and closer look at one of the meridian organ systems in TCM. You can see by looking at the liver meridian chart that there are many correspondences that equal the eight dimensions of health and wellness. It has physical correspondences. It has psycho-emotional ones. It even has natural correspondences such as the element of wind. There are many other correspondences that are not listed here and they actually include astrological ones and divinatory ones. So this whole system speaks very much to the holistic picture of the individual as human being is part of nature. There are even prescriptive suggestions that accompany a diagnosis and may very well include an energetic practice such as Qigong or Tai Chi routine. Illustrated here is the symbolic circular representation when considering the five elemental structure of life as it relates to the TCM model of diagnosis. Each element also has correspondences that are astrological, animal, and divinatory. As we discussed in Unit 2, a circular mandala is an appropriate image for the transpersonal journey because it is recognized transculturally as an archetype for intrinsic wholeness. There are similar parallels in Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine and other medicines with corresponding energetic theory and practices including specific yoga techniques and breathing methods. This is the circular representation of the Tibetan medicine five element chart. Looking at it in more detail, it has its own set of traditional correspondences that cover all eight areas and all eight dimensions of the healing chart that we have discussed previously. Indigenous or traditional medicines from around the world also have as their model the inclusive multi-layered personal and transpersonal areas of human experience. The World Health Organization defines traditional medicine in this way. Traditional medicine is the sum total of knowledge, skills, and practices based on the theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures that are used to maintain health, as well as to prevent, diagnose, improve, or treat physical and mental illnesses. This is a very comprehensive and inclusive picture. When we consider traditional medicine, whether it is from Greenland, Canada, Peru, or some other country, we are often speaking of one or a combination of the following. Indigenous spiritual knowledge and cosmology, shamanism, and indigenous herbal medicine. Shamanism as a health and healing method has spread cross-culturally around the world as interested students find their way to shamanic teachers in countries such as Peru, Mexico, and Mongolia there has been a clinical and theoretical synthesis between shamanism and psychology. Shamanism was initially brought to Western attention mostly through scientific field research by sociocultural anthropologists during the 19th and 20th centuries. There are many interesting academic articles in this area. 
including Canadian shamanism, and I have included some in the resources folder if you are interested in pursuing this subject from the academic perspective. For a generalized introduction to shamanism, from a Westerner's perspective, I encourage you to read the classic Western text called The Way of the Shaman, written by anthropologist Michael Harner. Harner is founder of the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, based in California. One of his teachers, Sandra Ingerman, has also become well-known as a Western shaman and teacher. And psychologists Roger Walsh and Jean Ochterberg also bring an academic and research background to the practice of shamanism. Further still, for a more pop culture version of shamans and their apprentices, the controversial author and anthropologist Carlos Castaneda began writing about his personal experiences in the 60s and 70s. He produced many non-fictional books based on his apprenticeship with a Yaqui Indian sorcerer in northern Mexico named Don Juan Matas. Keep in mind that the debate of their authenticity still remains today. However, whether they are authentic or not, they definitely help to open the door for popular culture to embrace, in a personal way, some of the academic research in shamanic cultures, non-ordinary states of consciousness, and non-linear and transpersonal thinking patterns as they relate to health and healing models. Lastly, there is one other area that I'd like to touch on here, and that is the contemporary recognition of the spiritual emergence phenomena. In earlier times, spiritually influenced psychotic episodes and behavior were usually experienced and contextualized within the cultural framework of a contemplative tradition or religious life. Later on, through the early lens of psychological history, they were commonly understood as episodes of hysteria or schizophrenia, or some such pathology. The clinical conditions of hysteria and schizophrenia absolutely exist, but what is under the contemporary transpersonal microscope at this time is that transpersonal crises can also occur and perhaps at times mimic the presentation and qualities of these other serious pathological conditions. Nowadays, with large numbers of lay people practicing meditation and spiritual disciplines such as yoga, shamanism, etc., there is an increased awareness and experience of the transpersonal crisis, or what Stanislav Grof labeled spiritual emergence. In transpersonal psychology research, this is presenting some interesting therapeutic and clinical concerns in the area of health, wellness, and wholeness. Spiritual emergence can take many forms in our lives, from the common midlife crisis and all of its variations in behavior and psycho-emotional experience, to exceptional kundalini experiences from the various yogic and energetic practices that have become commonplace. At this time, many transpersonal psychologists and researchers are examining spiritual emergence through the lens of both psychological and spiritual development. In your text, Paths Beyond Ego, on pages 131 to 152, this entire subject is discussed in detail from different clinician perspectives, and I really encourage you to read it. Let's look at a few key points in relation to the types of transpersonal crises that can occur. The first one is connected with a severe pathology situation. It's psychotic disorders that have mystical features. In these situations, I, and I quote, normal cognitive functions disintegrate. The psyche can be flooded with elements from all parts of the unconscious, high and low, pathological and transcendent. The second category is the psychological crisis that has developmental potential. And on the surface, this can resemble the first one, but the result, if successfully negotiated through therapeutic means, is that what was a psychological disturbance is now followed by resolution and repair to a higher level of functioning. This can include old beliefs, goals, identities, and lifestyles that do not serve a functional purpose anymore allowing them to be released and adopting newer, more supportive ones. 
So the first two forms can be triggered by stress, spiritual developmental crisis, or sometimes the psyche's inner forces compelling this development. The third category is hypothesized that a transpersonal crisis can also come from a lack of transpersonal experience on an individual, group, and global level. Maslow described this as metapathology, which means the failure to satisfy meta or transpersonal motives and needs. It is hypothesized that this lack may underlie widespread psychological and social disturbances. For example, uh, during developmental transition times such as transiting into our teen years, our midlife years, and our old age, all of these can be potential psycho-spiritual crises depending on the individual. Addictions and substance abuse, aside from their biological bases in some cases, are potentially seen as substitute gratification. Jung called this the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. Ken Wilbur also discussed substitute gratification, as paraphrased by Roger Walsh and Francis Vaughan in Paths Beyond Ego, in this way, the fundamental human drive to regain awareness of our true nature, Atman, is displaced by the craving for objects and experiences. According to Stanislav Grof, some forms that spiritual emergence can take are the following ones. When the kundalini, this spiritual energy that rests in the base of the spine, when that awakens through yogic or other energy practices, number two is shamanic journeying, which brings you to extend beyond the ordinary consciousness into transpersonal realms. Number three are psychic openings. Now some of you have seen contemporary films that illustrate um, physical accidents, for example car accidents, causing the brain to undergo some kind of a change that opens the psychic centers in the body. And the fourth one are possession states, again often covered in films. They can be religious based or past life material that spontaneously starts to emerge. Some of you may have heard of some children at the age of three and four remembering their past life. I will end this short discussion on spiritual emergence with a very important quote from Paths Beyond Ego that needs to be kept in mind as we review all of this transpersonal material in this course, but particularly in the health and healing sector with a, a specific nod to spiritual emergence and therapeutic work. This is not to say that all psychological distress is a developmental crisis or that all developmental crises, even transpersonal ones, will be successfully navigated and result in greater growth and well-being. Clearly, some people can be left impaired. One of the challenges facing transpersonal psychology is to identify and help people at risk from developmental crises and those practices that can precipitate them. In conclusion, we have looked at a broad background of influence in contemporary transpersonal healing illustrating some of the comprehensive health models around the world that have thousands of years of development behind them. They are transpersonal in that they incorporate what is termed non-ordinary states of consciousness and psycho-spiritual levels of evaluation and therapy in their approach to healing the body and mind. Today, in transpersonal healing practices, we are beginning to integrate the basic idea of wholeness from these world traditions into our health and wellness practices. Many of you are engaged in mind-body practices, either Tai Chi, Qigong, or yoga, etc. Or you receive medical treatments like acupuncture, Tui Na, which is Chinese massage, or even medical Qigong. Some of you 
were raised in Eastern traditions and still practice them, or possibly you have lost touch with them since immersed in Western culture. It is important to remember that these influences in the West are still relatively new, perhaps for the past 30 to 50 years only. A significant influence in transpersonal psychology, psychotherapy, and transpersonal healing from all traditions, including Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Islamic, Taoist, etc., has been meditation and contemplative processes. In your text, Modern Psychology and Ancient Wisdom, we will look at these approaches more closely with the specific chapter readings. They will include Buddhist mindfulness philosophy, Christian prayer healing, Taoist philosophy and health, and yoga's broad applications to health and healing. We will also review eco-psychology and deep ecology, healing through our relationship with nature. <laughs>